Now, um, we are blessed to have a special guest speaker in the person of Pastor Bob Amigo of Higher Rock Christian Church, a church that is respected not only here in the Philippines, but even abroad. And in fact, uh, Higher Rock Christian Church has developed a relationship with one of the more prominent churches in the United States, Grace Community Church. Um, one of the elders of that church is going to be speaking to them uh, very soon, sometime October. And um, this brother is a very special and very dear friend because we go back a long way. Uh, we were classmates in college in De La Salle University. We took up the same course. Uh, we took up uh, communication arts, which is otherwise known as mass communications. And it's interesting how God brought us into the ministry. We did not have any plans of becoming pastors. And interestingly, the Lord, in His grace, chose us, elected us for salvation. But not only salvation, He called us into ministry. And together with Him is His wife. Sister Suki, who has been a tremendous helpmate to Pastor Bob, she is a major con contributor to the ministry of Pastor Bob as well as Higher Rock Christian Church. I'd like us to know her. Uh, Sister Suki, amigo, could you please arise? This is Sister Suki. Praise the Lord for that. Now, Pastor Bob is not only here to preach to us. I have requested him to dedicate our sanctuary as a convention center. And it is apt that he does that for us since he is the vice chairman of CCM. And as far as many speakers are concerned, he is the face of CCM as well. And probably later on he can explain or maybe uh, share to us some of the speakers who are coming over. They are very, very prominent uh, speakers, and he will share that to us as well because he shares the same vision we have. So here in the Visayas and Mindanao region, we're trying to bring in very good speakers who can train and disciple us in the Metro Manila area and in the entire Luzon. They're also doing the same thing. They're also inviting some of these speakers. So I have requested him to uh, pray for us and pray for this convention site because we would like to be able to dedicate this to the Lord for his purposes. And I would like to request at this time, first of all, uh, for the Board of Elders to please come and join me on stage. And I would like them to join me on stage because these men have stood side by side uh, with me on this vision. They have confirmed this vision as coming from God, and they have been very supportive of this. Uh, it's not been easy uh, to challenge the people to own this vision because there were some people who thought that, well, we don't need to build something really that big. Uh, what we have downstairs is enough, but we felt that if we're going to be a blessing to our entire country and to other churches, we have got to build something bigger for the body of Christ. So again, this is not for us. This is for the body of Christ. So elders, could you please come? And may we request uh, Pastor Bob to please join us on stage to pray for us and then later on to minister to us the Word of God. And again, the Word of God, which I heard yesterday, is something very, very special. I hope that we will really pay attention and heed God's Word. Good morning. Hello. Yes, Pastor Ben and I go a long way. Back in college, uh, we've had many uh, adventures and misadventures. And uh, if you want to know a little bit more about our disco going days, uh, you want to know how your pastor did on the dance floor, you can come 
after church to ask. And I'll tell you all about how Pastor Mel really wowed the crowd in every disco that we went to. But that's another story. When your pastor, Pastor Mel, informed me that he was inviting me to dedicate this ministry center today, I could not help but think of the dedication of Solomon's temple in the Old Testament. In that episode, Solomon uttered a prayer that petitioned God to allow the beautiful temple to extend its influence in a threefold manner. In that episode, Solomon uttered a prayer first that the individual Jews of the nations might learn the righteousness of God. He prayed that sinners will be judged in the land and that the righteous will be justified. You can read that in 1 Kings chapter 8. He also prayed over the nation as a whole, that is, that Israel's sins might be forgiven, that its land might be healed, and that her people might be preserved in captivity. And then Solomon also prayed over the heathen, that is, that they might come to know and fear the one true God. Together with that prayer of dedication, the Israelites offered 120,000 sheep and 22,000 oxen. And in answer to that prayer, you will read in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. Well, we cannot pray for the exact same things as the worship of God in Solomon's temple is not for believers today. We also cannot pray for your, uh, we also cannot compare your pastor to Solomon. Without a doubt, I am impressed with the wisdom of your senior pastor. I am sure that he has displayed Solomonic wisdom over the years as a pastor. But I cannot compare him to Solomon because Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And I'm sure that not one of them is named Marie. But maybe we can slay 120,000 sheep and roast 20,000 oxen for Lechon Baca for our celebration today. Wouldn't you like that? You'd like that? Ask them. If your elders allow this, your church won't have to shop for food for the next year. I'm just kidding, of course, and I hope you understand that. This is just part of the joy that I'm sharing with you. Gracing this special occasion in your church is truly a blessing for my wife and me. I remember many years ago when your church was meeting for worship in a movie theater near Fuente Osmeña. If my memory serves me right, I remember even preaching in an afternoon service uh, at the Cebu Coliseum. I think you've had some history there as well. That was ages ago. But seriously, here you are today, rejoicing in the glory of God for what he has wonderfully accomplished through your senior pastor, your elders, ministry leaders, your workers, and fellow members. What a wonderful testimony of the greatness of the Lord our God. What a wonderful testimony to the vision, perseverance, and faith of your leaders. So on behalf of our church in Quezon City, Higher Rock, and the entire community of churches in CCM, I extend to Living Word Christian Church our warmest congratulations. We rejoice and celebrate this blessing with you all. And we are thankful that God has somehow woven our vision for not just for our individual churches, but for the nation as a whole. Pastor Mel was telling you about some of the conferences that are upcoming in Higher Rock. Well, Really, I pray that you will all take part in that. You will somehow find a way to get to Manila because these are valuable, these are valuable conferences that equip sa the saints, equip the workers. Many years ago, when we formed CCM, we had expressed to one another our burden to train pastors. I had seen how many pastors in the far-flung areas, far-flung provinces, who are laboring hard in the field, Laboring with very little, faithfully laboring. Yet they 
they were many of them are untrained. And so we had a vision to train them. We had a vision to equip these saints, these wonderful saints who are so faithful. And for our part in CCM, we came up with Faith Walk, Faith Walk magazine. That's the purpose of Faith Walk. We condense books so that pastors who could not afford those wonderful books from abroad can have a little digest that will give them something about what the work of God is all about. We've done that. But I thought God would be done with that. I thought that was it until the Lord opened conferences to us in higher up, inviting one speaker after the other. We said, this thing can't just be for Manila. Very soon, we will have doc Dr. Mark Tatlock to speak, as your pastor said, in October, to speak in the, uh, on the topic of the Christian and the workplace. A wonderful topic. I hope you young people and you who are in the corporate world can join us. It's a wonderful speaker. His heart is really for, for reaching out to many people all over the world, and he travels all over the world too. Well, on top of that, you've got many people lined up. We've, in July of 2017, Dr. Steve Lawson will be coming to Manila. He's already confirmed. He's all booked up. We've already made arrangements. And Dr. Steve Lawson, for some of you who don't know him, is a wonderful expositor, great preacher. Many say that if the Lord takes John MacArthur home, he is one of the top people who might take his place because of the way he ministers the Word of God. Come to Manila for that. After I realized that the many things that God is opening to us, I told our leaders in Hyrak, hey guys, sure, we have them here. Sure, there are many churches in and around Metro Manila come to, to join our conferences. But I said, we still have Luzon and Mindanao. Many of the pastors there are not able to come to Manila. It's not just a plane fare. It's where to stay for those next days. So it's pretty prohibitive for many. So I said, well, maybe we can go to Cebu. And this place is perfect. This place is perfect for that venue. You begin to see how God is weaving things. We did not know what God would do when we first invited our conference speaker, but God has led one person to the other. Sometimes, like, Last November, we invited Pastor Mike Gendron. And we didn't know that Pastor Mike Gendron was the roommate of Dr. Steve Lawson when they were in seminary. And after his wonderful experience there, I said, Pastor Mike, you know, one day I hope and pray Dr. Steve would come. I didn't know they had a relationship. He said, Steve? Oh, I know Steve. I'll put in a good word for you. And so when we started doing that work, inviting Dr. Steve Dr. Mike, Pastor Mike said, Steve, you've got to go to the Philippines. You have to meet these people. You have to minister there. See how God is faithfully opening doors? And then you have this convention center. Wonderful. Perfect. I don't know what God has in store for us in the future. Mel said last night, maybe one day we can have all these speakers in one week Something, something like a T4G conference where all speakers are lined up. We, also are, we are also working on Dr. Stuart Scott and Martha Peace to come back. They will be doing a back-to-back -back thing, ministering to the husbands, ministering to the wives. Again, if that is successful in Manila, my plan is to bring it also here in Cebu. So let's not limit God. Let's realize that God is continually at work. All we need to do is to be faithful with what we have today. That's it. How God will make that grow is His, is his work. It's His plan. I'm just here to be faithful. I'm just here to do my best with what God has given me. And the rest is up to Him. And I think that God will be pleased that way. Don't you? So today, while I said earlier that we cannot pray exactly like King Solomon of the Old Testament, we can certainly em emulate his heart's desire and spirit as he dedicated the temple. We can pray similarly that this center might be used of God for the establishment of righteousness in the land through you, 
the members of this church. That the Lord God might use the ministry of your church to bring spiritual healing upon the souls of many according to God's sovereign mercy, of course. And that through the many ministries that will be established in this center, in this very hall, that many might come to fear God and be converted in Christ Jesus. So I'd like you all to stand this morning. And join me in praying for your leaders who are spearheading the development of this center and for your church and this ministry center as a whole. Let's come before God. Heavenly Father, we are amazed at how you work, O oh God. Sometimes you just give us small things, but by your grace, you have taught us to just be faithful. And that small thing grows into something we could never have imagined. Lord, that is the story that we see here in the building of this center. Given something little, yet by your grace, you have made it to what it is today. And I pray, God, I join the members of this church and the leaders standing here on this stage, I join them in praying, God, that the establishment of righteousness in the land might begin from this place. Dear God, I ask that you might, through your Holy Spirit, open our minds, open our hearts, and allow us to live by your grace as, as shining lights to a world that is darkened around us. I also pray, God, that through the ministry of living word and this center whatever it is lord god that you will allow work to be established here i pray that according to your sovereign mercy that healing upon souls the, upon the souls of many might happen that many may will realize the saving truth of the gospel and come to salvation in christ jesus i ask god that you bless this center Thank you, dear God, for what you've begun. And thank you, dear God, that you're continuing not just to add to the edifice, not just to add to the building, but to build also in the hearts and lives of the people who are part of this church. I ask God that you might bless Pastor Mel and his elders. Continually make the vision clear in his heart and in their hearts and minds. And help them, dear God. Help them to pursue this with zeal, knowing, Father, your perfect will. Lord, many times they will encounter challenges. This is all part of our work in the ministry. But I pray, God, that they will never be deterred. I pray, God, that they will stand firm and that they will continue the work that you have entrusted in their hands. And I pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you will continue to encourage the members to support them in all their endeavors. I pray, Father, that if possible, God, bring a refreshing upon the people here in Cebu, through this church. I pray, Father, that this center truly might stand as a shining light to all around here. And may, the, may they see only the glory of Christ Jesus. Continue to provide for their needs, not just for their financial or material needs, but also for their spiritual needs. I pray, God, that the works of the enemy will also not be successful against this church and against this ministry center. Whatever, Lord, the enemy might hurl against them, Father, let those flaming arrows fall down without touching any one of them. I thank you, God, because you are our shepherd, you are our help, you are our rock, and we entrust this wonderful center into your hands. Allow your Holy Spirit to always fill this place. Whatever works is done here, O God, may they be to your glory. We give you praise and thanks, dear God, for what you have done here. We commit, we dedicate this wonderful church building, this center into your loving hands. And we pray, God, that you alone might be glorified. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen.
I asked Pastor Mel a couple of weeks ago what he thought I should share with your congregation. He essentially gave me the freedom to choose any topic or text. But he mentioned that he wanted me to share something that would echo the call to nation building. So I asked myself, what would be one of the ways for Christians to be used of God to help build the nation? Of course, this question may be answered in a number of ways. But, but as I prayed about it more, I realized that one of the primary ways that believers can establish their role in nation building is to ensure that they are rooted in God's holy word. But how can we do this? Obviously, the idea of being rooted in God's word is pretty broad and can also be answered in a number of ways. So I decided to whittle down my choices to something more practical, something that would help us develop the proper frame of mind and heart when, and whenever we hear God's holy word proclaimed. Something that can help us become a noble-minded people. I invite you to read with me Acts chapter 17. Let's start with verse 10 all the way to verse 12. I'll be reading from the NASB version. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. Acts 17 is best known for Paul's teaching on Mars Hill in Athens. That episode, however, comes in the latter part of the chapter. But it is safe to say that the second most notable episode in the chapter is Paul's wonderful experience in his ministry to the Bereans. How did Paul reach Berea? Well, this episode is part of Paul's second missionary journey. Originally, it was not in Paul's plan to head to Europe where the city of Berea was found. But while they were ministering in Troas, Paul saw in a vision, and we can read this in verse 9 of Acts 16, a man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Thus, the missionary team composed then of Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, saw the gates of Europe suddenly open for the gospel. Their first ministry in Europe was in the city of Philippi. In that city, Luke's narrative tells the conversion of a few people. Of the gospel trouble followed them. And since the situation became untenable, Paul, Silas, and Timothy pulled out of Philippi. They decided to leave Luke behind to care for the new converts in the city who would soon become members of the church. From Philippi, the three men went straight to Thessalonica. In this city, some people once again warmly receive the saving gospel of the Lord Jesus. Thus, we are told in verse 4 of Acts 17, and some of them, that people in the synagogue, were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. So some of the Jews believed, convinced against their prejudice, Greeks believed, convinced without prejudice, and some of the leading women, attracted by the new light of the gospel, were also persuaded. The word persuaded right there in verse 4 signifies being convinced of the argument of the teacher. And that is significant. These people saw a reasonable presentation of the gospel. 
And the Holy Spirit used that to bring enlightenment. Thus, these people associated with the apostles. They joined the community. And in that hour, we see the birth of the church in Thessalonica. But the ministry in Thessalonica did not only spell triumph for Paul and his team. Trouble hit them once again due to the jealousy of the Jews. A mob comprised of wicked men from the marketplace was therefore put together in order to do harm to the missionaries. And we read that in the first part of verse 5. They went to the residence of Jason in whose house the missionaries had been staying to look for Paul and Silas. But failing to find them there, these wicked men therefore turned to Jason. After some rough handling from this mob, eventually Jason and the others posted some sort of bond to ensure the good conduct of the apostles. And you can read that in verse 9. But this development proved missionaries could no longer stay in the city as the others in the new community of believers might also be put at risk. So once again, in what has become a familiar scene in the book of Acts, we find Paul and Silas escaping Thessalonica under threat from opposers of the gospel. But it is important for us not to overlook the fact that in each of the places where Paul ministered and left under threat, he planted the seed of the gospel in the hearts of men and women and founded a local church. Now this leads us to our text, verses 10 to 12. Paul and Silas traveled to Berea in the middle of the night, indicating a hasty exit from the city and a concern for their safety. As we read in verse 10, they traveled about 45 miles southwest of Thessalonica until they reached Berea. And according to Paul's preferred ministry method, the preaching in Berea begins once more in the synagogue. Now, the, Luke, the author of the book of Acts, describes the Bereans, the Berean Jews, as more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And this verse is the focal point of our study this morning. When Luke says that they were more noble-minded than the Jews of Thessalonica, he was not referring to their social status. Luke's reference here is in regard to their attitude toward God's Word. The Bereans reverence the, whole, the Old Testament Scriptures as the Word of God. They saw it as the only source of divine truth. Moreover, the Berean Jews did not have the kind of prejudices that the Thessalonian Jews did. They did not harden their hearts to divine truth in order to accommodate their doctrinal traditions, their religious customs, or their philosophical opinions. Now, every preacher will tell you that there is nothing more delightful than to have the privilege of preaching the gospel of Christ to people who are ready and eager to hear it. Every preacher would love that. And to be sure, like Cornelius and his household, the Bereans had been prepared by the Holy Spirit to receive His Word. This was not something that was innate or natural to the Bereans. Certainly, the Holy Spirit was at work in them. And we cannot minimize the work of the Holy Spirit. Now Luke provides us with three statements to describe the Bereans' engagement with Paul's preaching of the Scriptures. These statements provide a pattern or model as to how preaching ought to be heard at any time. They provide answer to the question, how should we listen to a sermon or teaching from the Holy Scriptures. So this is primarily for all of you. How should we listen to a sermon? Well, we are given three statements here. First, from our text, 
we are told that the Bereans received the word. More specifically, in verse, the first part of verse 11, it says, they received the word with great eagerness. Now, this does not mean that they were naive and simply accepted and believed everything they heard. It means that they were open to the gospel and had not prejudged it. In other cities, the people tended to regard the gospel as something to be rejected immediately simply because it was something new. But here in Berea, there was a sense of expectancy about their listening. They were sincere and genuine in their anticipation of what they were about to hear. In fact, they viewed it both as important and needful. It was not something that they just, okay, since we have nothing to do on a Sunday or on a Saturday, let's try and go to church. Let's go to the synagogue. Nope. They realized that this was needful. Thus, their attention was riveted when Paul preached. If they were living in our generation, they would be the kind of Christians who would not go to church half asleep. Is there somebody half asleep? That's okay. These are the, they, they were the kinds of Christians if they were living today. Or with their minds wandering in many directions. When they came to church, they came with the hope of hearing from God. Now I'm sure you've observed that people can really get enthusiastic about their entertainment activities. Have you noticed that? Whether it's a sporting event, a show, a movie, a concert, or a play, people are engaged in pre-event anticipation, sometimes even lasting for days. You've probably heard about those die-hard Star Wars fans that anticipate the next sequel of the movie franchise. Days before the first screening, they literally camp out theaters in line, hoping to get the best seats. They are eager to watch their favorite movie and expect something special to occur. And when they finally watch the movie, they relive some of the moments over and over their minds and even discuss it with renewed fervor over and over with their fellow die-hard fans. And sometimes they even share this over and over to non-die-hard fans in an effort to, quote-unquote, evangelize them. Why don't you watch the friends? Watch the movies. Frankly, I think people like that need to get a life. I mean, if, if a movie franchise is what a person lives for, it simply shows the shallowness of his existence, his attachment to the things of the and the absence of an eternal perspective. And that is certainly, certainly not the way to live. But as a pastor, what I find sad is the fact that unlike those movie fans, there are many Christians who have no sense of expectation, no sense of anticipation when it comes to a sermon or teaching from God's Word. And you can easily spot them in church. The body language... You know, how they sit. The obvious disengagement. Our, our center is small, so I can see practically their eyes, if they're engaged or not. The frequent glances at the watch. The numerous trips to the comfort room, apart from medical or anatomical condition, of course. And the many times they loiter hallway to look at the bulletin boards which they've already surveyed many times before. All this betrayed their lack of interest. It shows the absence of anticipation. But wouldn't it be great to have Christians camp outside the, the, their churches to make sure they got the best seats on Sunday? Wouldn't it be great to see early in the morning, 5 a.m., 
thousands of people are lining up from your entrance, from here, all the way to Ayala. And people are saying, what's going on? What are you lining up for? Where we're going to church? Where at? Banawa. What? Your line ends here? Yep. Stay in line. Go to the end. Wouldn't it be great? Everybody's excited. Everybody's expecting to hear God speak. This was actually a marvel. That was reported in a number of books that documented times of great revival in various places in the world in different periods of time. It happened before. During those times, people would line up early outside church to ensure they got the best seats. Wouldn't it be great to see this all happen again? Wouldn't it be great if God, by His sovereignty, by the sovereign will of His Holy Spirit, come down upon us and revive us so that every Sunday we have this sense of expectation? Of course, I admit, sermons can be dull and lifeless. It can be devoid of passion in delivery and be woefully ill-prepared. And perhaps... In some situations, there is a real need to address the issue of dull sermons. But in our text, the focus is on the Berean listener rather than the style and delivery of the Apostle Paul. Now, I do not mean to say that to listen with eagerness to a sermon is something that comes naturally to Christians. To be sure, this is something that needs careful cultivation on our part. But let me ask you, what exactly do you expect to occur when you come to hear a sermon preached? What do you expect? Do you expect to receive new information? Do you expect to be entertained? Do you expect to be given a pep talk to help you through the coming week? Well, we need to understand this. Preaching is more than the business of imparting information. It does this, of course, but it is much more than this. Preaching in its best form is called expository preaching. It is the preaching of who knows the Holy Scripture to be the living Word of the living God. Thus, the preacher's goal and desire is to set God's Word free to speak its own message. In other words, the faithful preacher digs out of the text the message that God has put therein. But it does not end there. Ultimately, preaching the Word of God is designed to ensure that those who listen are brought to God Himself. They are brought to meet God. Therefore, preachers can demand and exhort as though they are, as Paul put it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through them, begging people on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. So preachers are mere ambassadors. They represent God's kingdom. Of course, preaching in this manner cannot happen unless both preacher and listener believe in the authority and significance of the Scriptures. Uh, a low view of preaching, and preachers as well as listeners are guilty of this, is often associated with or is a direct consequence of a shallow desire to know what the Bible teaches. It is actually a mark of a loss of spiritual appetite for God's Word. So unless... We are in love with Scripture itself. We will always have shallow views and even shallower expectations of sermons. Let's take our cue then from the psalmist. Notice his attitude. He said in Psalm 119, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Do you know how to read that verse? You don't read that verse. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Now you sense the, sense the heart of the writer. He said, Oh, how I love your law. 
It is my meditation every day, all the day. This should be read with passion. Now let me ask you, and I don't ma want to put you in a fix here, especially you husbands. How many of you are in love or have been in love? May I see your hands? You know what it's like to be in love. You husbands better raise your hands because I see your wives looking at you. Are you in love? Let me see your hands. Raise them high. You're in love. I'm in love. Wife, look at me. I'm in love. So cook me something nice tonight. You're in love. You know what it's like to be in love, right? When you're in love, especially if during the first time, the first few months, you know, back during my time, we didn't have that term, monsery, you know, monsery. Now they, they even celebrate the monsery. It's a good thing we didn't have that during our time. We just had the anniversary because mas tipid, di ba? Can you imagine if you have to date your loved one, uh, your beloved, every month? Uh, anyway, back then, oh, I, honey, it's our monsery. You're so excited. Back then, when you were not yet married, you were just so madly in love with him or with her. There was that sense of expectation that made it all exciting, right? Come the weekend, you've been hard at work in the office, and now comes the weekend. What are you anticipating in the weekend? Church? I don't think so. What are you expecting? You expect to see him or her, right? You expect that when you set a date, you expect, you're anticipating, what will she wear? What will she look like? She expects, where will he take me? Will he have flowers, a bouquet of flowers when I see him at the door? How good will he smell? Ah, sense of expectation. And you expect a wonderful night, wonderful night, just being together. It's like the whole world vanishes and it's just you and her and everything is just so nice and sweet. Sense of expectation. Right? You, you want that. You're, you're looking for that. Being in love. Kaya nga, there's that old song. You remember that old song? Don't you lie. Some of you might remember this. It was during the time of your pastor, Pastor Mel. It's in Tagalog. That song goes, Di na makatulog. Ah, you remember. <laughs> Di na makakain. Tagyawat sa ilong. Bakit? Why was that singer singing that way? What was he singing about? He was singing about being in love. He can't sleep. He can't eat. Thinking of the, the person he loves. Are you in love with Scripture? Why can't that, bakit hindi na siya makatulog? Because she is his meditation all day long. Are we that way with regards to Scripture? Are we in love with Scripture? Can we say with the psalmist, Oh, how I love your law! Now this means that if we are to cultivate a sense of expect expectancy when it comes to preaching, we also need to prepare ourselves for it. Okay? These Bereans were not expectant just because a visiting preacher had come into town. Their sense of expectancy on this occasion reveals a habit, a discipline, whereby they train themselves to approach preaching in a certain way. Like the psalmist, the Bereans thought about and thought through the Old Testament Scripture all day, every day. And like them, we need to cultivate this discipline. You can't just expect to be filled spiritually when you open your Bibles here on Sunday morning. You can't expect that. You, you have to learn to develop opening to the Scriptures all day, every day. But if you don't read your Bibles regularly, if you don't make a habit of listening to audio tapes or reading Christian books, if you don't ponder over and reflect on, script, uh, on scriptural truth, then you certainly will not 
have a sense of anticipation when you go to church on Sunday. Now, I need to underscore that having this sense of expectation or expectancy also involves faithful and earnest prayer for the preacher during the course of the week, which is something that we in Higher Rock always do in our midweek prayer service every Wednesday. And I'm sure you have that here. Because I know you have an intercessory prayer group. But I think this must continually be done, especially in the hours leading up to the worship. Perhaps we should all make the effort to pray on Saturday evening and not just leave this to the intercessory ministry. And, and even pray early Sunday morning for the exposition of the Scripture. But what about the listeners? Well, the cure for sleepy heads on Sunday morning is to get to bed earlier on Saturday night. It's as simple as that. You see, the truth is we are powerless to resist idle thoughts during our Sunday worship service. If we make no preparation, resist them beforehand. But in addition to disciplined preparation, I believe the cultivation of a sense of expectancy can be aided by the practice of taking notes. Of course, not everyone agrees that this is helpful. Some find taking notes a distraction to the sense of the Lord's presence they feel during the preaching of the Word as the Holy Spirit begins to work upon their heart and conscience. But for others, and I would include myself in this group, taking notes helps in concentrating on what is being said. Now, the second thing that we may note in how the Bereans engage Paul's preaching is the way they examine the Scriptures. Luke reports also in verse 11 that the Berean Jews were examining the Scriptures to see whether these things were so. Now, when Luke referred to the Scriptures, he was referring to the various scrolls of the Old Testament. Don't think that they had their own individual Bibles. They didn't. We must remember that back then, people were unlikely able to possess their own scrolls of the Old Testament. These scrolls were expensive to acquire as it involved painstaking copying by a scribe. Therefore, the Bereans had to consult copies that were kept in the synagogue. This means that for several days after the Sabbath, the Jews purposefully came back to the synagogue and searched the scrolls to check whether what Paul said were true or not. Unlike us, they did not have the convenience of having a personal copy of these scrolls in their homes, on their phones, or tablets. Obviously, we want to seriously examine the Scriptures. If, if we want to seriously examine the Scriptures when it is being preached, we must learn to listen attentively. A good picture of listening attentively is found in Luke chapter 19, verse 48. This passage describes people who were very attentive to the Lord's teaching. We read, All the people were hanging on every word He said. Every word that Jesus said. This attentiveness involves banishing wandering thought, dullness of mind, and drowsiness. It regards a sermon a matter of life and death. I wonder if you've ever felt that way. I need to go to church. I need to have the best seat in the house so that I can listen to the word preached because for me, it is a matter of life and death. Do you have that attitude? Now, that was the attitude that Moses was endorsing to the Israelites. If you remember in Deuteronomy 32, Verses 46 to 47, we read in the passage, He, meaning Moses, said to them, Take to your heart all the words which, with which I am warning you today, which you shall command your sons to observe carefully, even all the words of this law, for it is not an idle word for you. Notice the next words. Indeed, it is your life. 
And by this word, you will prolong your days in the land which you are, you are about to cross the land, the Jordan, to possess. Friends, we must learn not to listen to sermons as spectators, but as participants. The preacher should not be the only one working on Sunday. But we must realize that good listening is hard work. It involves worshiping God continuously. Thus, an attentive listener responds quickly, whether in repentance, resolution, determination, or praise, so that God is honored in His listening. That, by the way, is the reason why we worship first with songs before the preaching of the Word, so that we might be in a worshipful attitude as we listen to God's Word. As Proverbs 18, verse 15 says, The heart of the prudent acquires knowledge, and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. The verbs used in this verse actually refer to energetic mental action. So we are not to be mere spectators, but we are to be energetic participants. You know, too many people come to church expecting to be spoon-fed. They have no desire to think, learn, or grow. They simply want to hear familiar preaching. They are not anxious to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. This passivity seems abnormal since in other areas of life, humans resist being spoon-fed. For instance, a 16-year-old child would certainly be embarrassed if his mother fed him, you know, fed him food in front of his church, in front of his friends. We are also aware that at work and in school, people expect intellectual challenges, right? Yet at church, some people do not want to be challenged emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually. They would rather be patted on the back or left alone than be convicted and challenged by God's Word. Instead of hearing instruction on Christian living from Paul's epistles, such people would rather hear a little Bible story every Sunday. But please observe, the Lord Jesus did not spoon-feed His hearers. For example, in one parable, the Lord Jesus talked about an unjust judge, right? You remember that? The Lord compared God to, his, to this judge, but He did not waste time in a lengthy explanation of how God is not unjust. Rather, Jesus challenged His hearers to use their minds to work through the difficult teaching of this parable. Notice also that because Jesus expected his listeners to be discerning and assertive, the Lord could make strong statements without apology. For example, Luke 14 verse 26, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Did Jesus apologize for such a statement? Did he say, Pasensya na po kayo. I know your culture is a very close, you have very close-knit families. I know you value your relationship with your siblings, with your mother, with your father. Pasensya na kayo. But I have to say this. Jesus did not apologize for that, did he? Notice also that Jesus also often let the truth he proclaimed to stand alone without explanation. For example, he spoke about cutting off hands, plucking out eyes, and cutting off feet. He said that some of the children of darkness are smarter than the children of light. He used metaphors, hyperbole, and other figures of speech, and he did not have to explain them all. Why? Because he was challenging his listeners. So even with running the risk of being misunderstood, the Lord Jesus refused to spoon-feed 
those who were following him. He challenges us to think, and that takes work. We must learn to stretch our minds by listening. We must learn to reach out with all our mental and spiritual to grasp the meaning of a message. Now notice a couple of things revealed in the response of these Bereans. First, observe the priesthood of all believers. The Bereans searched the scriptures themselves. They did not need the intermediary of some priest to teach them what they needed to know about God and His Word. It is not impossible, of course, to think that they ask help from the local rabbi every now and then and those who had some measure of maturity in their understanding. But this did not, does not raise the fact that the scriptures were open to everyone to examine. The rab neither did the rabbi say, you cannot read the scriptures. You're not trained. Notice they understood that the scriptures were for them as well. That's the priesthood of all believers. At the very least, therefore, it should be an, an encouragement to us to bring our Bibles with us to our worship services or our Bible study meetings and to open them and to follow along when the Word of God is being read, quoted, or preached. This is the reason why it has often been said that the holiest sounds of worship service are the frequent rustling of the pages of Scripture when the Word of God is being expounded at the pulpit and the congregation is busy examining for themselves the truth of what is being said. That's the holiest sound. The turning, the rustling pages of the Bible as the believers are following with the Word of God being preached. That I guess the sound of the rustling pages of the Bible is almost gone as many today use their smartphones or computer tablets to read along. It has now been replaced by the squeaking sound of your fingers that your fingers make when you scroll down or flip the pages of your phones or tablets. Frankly and personally, maybe we should pray that the computer and phone manufacturers will one day install an electronic sound of turning pages, rustling pages, when we read our Bibles from these modern gadgets, you know, just to bring back the holy sound of our worship service. Now, the second thing to observe in this particular response of the Bereans is the affirmation of the perspicuity or clarity of the Scriptures. The word perspicuity is simply translated clarity. And I like what the Westminster Confession states in regard to the perspicuity of Scripture. Let me quote it to, for you. They said, All things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. Yet those things that are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and open in some place of the Scripture or other that not only the learned but the unlearned in a proper use of the ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. End of quote. In other words, what the Westminster Confession is asserting is that the essentials of the Bible are clear and easy to understand and can be understood by using the ordinary means of learning. This will therefore include asking a number of questions, listening carefully to faithful exposition from teachers, listening with discernment, reading books, doing research, and a host of other means. We can do this because of the clarity of Scripture. When we affirm the perspicuity or clarity of Scripture, this is not to say, of course, that every Christian on first reading of a passage of Scripture will understand everything instantly. We are aware that there are several things in the Bible that we can understand clearly, but there are passages that are also difficult to grasp, even by scholars. But the 
Westminster Confession attests, believers can use the ordinary means of learning to understand God's Word. You know, a recent Barna report conducted among professing Christians in the United States revealed some very interesting discoveries. For instance, it found that 8% of these professing Christians believe that the saying, God helps those who help themselves, is found in the Bible. 8% believe that that's there. Isn't that passage in the Bible? Isn't that passage found in Philippians chapter 5, verse 1? What about the other, my other favorite verse in the Bible? God knows who does not pay. Isn't that in the Bible? That's a really a favorite passage of mine. 63%, according to the survey, cannot name the four Gospels. Can you name the four Gospels? That's easy, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Paul. In the survey, 58% cannot name half of the Ten Commandments. Can you name half of the Ten Commandments? Well, I know the Eleventh Commandment. Do you know the Eleventh Commandment? It's this. Thou shalt not eat salt because it is a sin. In that survey, 58% are not aware that Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. Wasn't it Moses who preached the Sermon on Mount Sinai? In that survey, 52% do not know that the book of Jonah is in the Bible. Oh, now I get it. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Jonah. In that survey, 48% do not know that the Gospel of Thomas is not in the Bible. Oh, so it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Thomas. How much, how well do you know your Bible? Do you know your Bibles well? It might be you too one day. It helped me. It helped me that I pay attention to what I'm reading in the Bible. Because one day, one time I was, I was in at the U.S. Embassy. And they looked at me. I was applying for a visa. I wanted to attend the Shepherds Conference. And, and they, one, they, the, the consul there took one look at my papers, papers and realized that I was a pastor and that I was supposed to attend a pastor's conference. So she asked me, I just have one question for you. She said, who is the oldest man in the Bible? She was Korean-American, so at first I could not understand. The oddest man? Who's the oddest oldest man. Oh, the oldest man. You know, I said, Methuselah, 969 years. Okay, so, so I got my visa. So, know your Bibles well, especially when you're going to the U.S. Embassy to apply for a visa. It will help you. It will save your life. Now, I hope you're, <laughs> I hope you're clapping for the right reason. It's not just for the U.S. visa. It is your life. Admittedly, it is difficult to know from that survey what they mean by professing Christians. And the level of knowledge of the Scriptures varies from one congregation to another. That survey does indicate that there are many who visit or attend church that may well be ignorant of the basic truths of the Bible. And this is appalling. Going back to our text, I would like you to observe that the Bereans were preoccupied with what was being said rather than who was saying it. The enthusiasm displayed by the Bereans was not centered on the preacher himself, who was, of course, Paul. What really grabbed their interest was, that, was what Paul taught, and more specifically, the gospel that he proclaimed. In this regard, the Bereans proved that they were nobler even than even the Corinthian Christians. Remember, one of the problems that Paul saw among the Corinthian believers was their tendency to evaluate preachers more than to evaluate the, uh, the gospel being preached. Thus, among the Corinthian believers, Paul had his own fans club. Peter had his, and so did Apollo. And some very spiritual ones took the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, thankfully, the Bereans were not like 
their Christian counterparts. They search the scriptures in order to better understand the gospel rather than to sign up for the preacher's fan club. I know that Pastor Mel does a wonderful job preaching and expositing the scriptures. But I hope and pray that when somebody else comes, like a pastor from Quezon City, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you will not just say, ah, ah, hindi si Pastor Mel, alis na lang tayo. Ah, hindi si Pastor Mel. Or, I hope you, you don't have that, that attitude like the Corinthians said. Paul was appalled when he saw that. He said, what, what are you doing? Don't have this fans club attitude. Listen to the word of God being preached. Of course, every preacher appreciates some encouragement from time to time. It would be a blessing to any preacher to have some members of the congregation come up to him to say that the sermon delivered was truly helpful and clear. That's a blessing for any preacher. You know, and you know, a pastor can normally tell if his sermon is connecting to or appreciated by his own congregation. But when he is preaching in a different church, and especially to a congregation in a different country, it could be quite challenging. And any pastor would certainly like some affirmation from the congregation. I remember having the privilege to preach in a number of churches in the United States at one time. As I preached in one church, I was surprised to hear people repeatedly say, Preach it, brother! <clears throat> preach it, brother! Oh yes, that's right! Go on! Preach it! Preach it! Amen! Hallelujah! Yeah. That was really surprising for me because we were not in the Bible Belt of America. In fact, we were in a white church. Only Suki and I were not Caucasian. We were, Suki and I were the only ones who were not Caucasian. And we were the shortest there. Everybody were like, they were like trees. You know, we were like bushes <laughs> amidst trees. I, I just thought that that was not done in a church like that. So I tried to ignore them, but it was too late. When they were, when they were saying that, I, I was already kind of distracted. So I just preached on. But I, but I guess that experience was not really bad as it was an affirmation of what I was saying. Later, the pastor said that he knew that the message I delivered was appreciated because the congregation never did that before, he said. Oh, really? I said, so that was a good thing, I guess. But the best encouragement for any preacher is that the congregation has caught a glimpse of God's glory shining in the face of Jesus Christ as the Word of God is being preached. That's the greater encouragement. Thus, the big question that must rise to the surface with every sermon is, who is big the sermon? Who is being exalted above everyone and everything else? Well, what must be said of every sermon is Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. For we do not, know, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as bond servants for Jesus' sake. That's what preachers are like, merely bond servants. And from this pulpit, I pray that it is always Jesus Christ who is preached, that it is Christ Jesus who is big in this pulpit. Or does the preacher's sermon say more about the preacher than it does about the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, Paul did not preach himself. It was Christ Jesus who was big in his sermons. And the Bereans did not focus on Paul or Silas. They focused on the message that this man proclaimed. And I believe it was an encouragement to Paul that the Bereans caught a glimpse of God's glory when he preached and when they received the gospel of salvation in Jesus. No doubt the Bereans were checking out the scriptures, scripture references that they had heard Paul citing during the course of the sermon. They probably focused on Paul's statement regarding the coming of the Messiah and his work. They probably wanted to know if Paul's words about Jesus of Nazareth 
his life, death, and resurrection square with what the Old Testament taught. They probably asked the essential question, could this carpenter from Nazareth be the divine Messiah promised in the Hebrew Scriptures? So with these questions, we could imagine the Reans eagerly opening scroll after scroll to see if these things were so, and the gospel became clear to them. Brethren, like the Bereans, we should learn to let our minds as well as our hearts be engaged when listening to a preacher on the Word of God. The third way that shows how the Bereans engaged Paul's preaching is seen in their response. The Bereans did not only receive and examine the Word of God, they responded to it as well. Now notice in our text that Luke seems to be careful in drawing the connection between what the Bereans examined based on what Paul said in the Old Testament Scriptures and the response of faith that followed. We read in verse 12, Therefore many of them believed. The word therefore is important. It refers back to verse 11. You see, as a result of their examination, God gave the Bereans faith and the salvation in Christ. In other words, their response of faith was in proportion to or as a result of careful examination. If you are here for the first time, or if you've never heard the gospel preached to you before, and you come to this church, and you hear the gospel preach, the appeal of Pastor Mel or whoever preacher is preaching here, appealing for you to be reconciled to God through His Word, through Christ Jesus, I pray that that might be your, your response. I pray that you will not just immediately discard this, but you will carefully examine the message being delivered to you and come to salvation in Christ Jesus. The fruit of the Bereans' examination is clear in their obedience. They did not just do research and come up with a substantial research paper about what Paul declared. They responded with their will and their heart. You see, listening correctly to good sermons should result in a desire to put in practice. Listening correctly to good sermons should result in applying the Bible's teaching to daily life. Listening carefully to good sermons should result in us laying hold of God's promises and Scripture during times of trouble, during times in knowing what sins to avoid when we are tempted, in eliciting praise from our hearts as we discover God's great attributes, in cultivating the right virtues in our characters, in learning what goals we should pursue, and in understanding what good works we should engage. Why can we expect to do all this when we listen correctly to good sermons? Because as Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 verse 15, the sacred writings are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's what the scriptures do. They give us wisdom so that we might be saved in Christ. And Paul asks the reason why this is so in the next verse, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, which is a verse that every Christian should memorize. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So what all this tells us is that the Bereans understood very well that whatever Scripture teaches must be obeyed. They understood that the Scriptures are the sole ground of authority in matters of faith and life. They did not consult the rabbis as much as they went to the Scriptures. In every situation they found themselves in, they asked, What does the Scripture say? I hope you have that habit. In every situation you face, What does the Scripture say? Let's say you find yourself in Manila and you find yourself caught in that horrendous traffic, how should you react? The question to ask is, what does the Scripture say? 
In everything, give thanks. Yes, give thanks in the, in the terrible traffic in Manila. I know it's hard. But we do it every day. What does the scripture say? That was how they dealt with every issue in their lives. So Paul's ministry to the Bereans was a great encouragement for him. But as may be expected, satanically inspired opposition once again came to the fore as we see in verse 13. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. So persecution once again broke out. And this again forced Paul to leave Berea. We read in verses 14 to 15, Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for, for Silas and Timothy to come to as soon as possible, they left. With this development, I would like to call your attention to the fact that the offense of the cross has not ceased nor even diminished. Now, perhaps some people might think that after being run out of town in Philippi and Thessalonica, have the sense to at least be a little bit more diplomatic and careful with what he was teaching. After all, he's been run out of town twice already. Maybe some people think that Paul should not have been too idealistic and should have realized that the best would be to slip the truth and offense of the cross in small, imperceptible doses. Well, Paul knew that that was not what God wanted him to do. Remember, the Lord Jesus did not compromise the truth and was crucified for it. Why should Paul do otherwise? So we are reminded of four truths from the brief history in Berea. First, to those who are called, to God's elect, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Romans 1 verses 15 to 16 explains that. You see, there is no need for compromise. The message we preach is God's means of grace to His people. To compromise the message is to destroy the means. Second, we are reminded that to an unbeliever, the gospel of Christ is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, as Peter described in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 to 8. You see, friends, it is not possible to make the divine truth palatable to natural men. The only way God's ambassador deal with his enemies is to confront them and demand surrender on God's terms. Third, any preacher or any church who faithfully preaches the gospel of God's free and sovereign grace in Christ will suffer for it. You see, the world will never embrace those who faithfully declare the truth of God. I know what your prayer is. I know your prayer is that your church might become faithful to, to the Word of God. Amen? But I wish there was good news following that. If your church, or any local church for that matter, faithfully preaches the Word of God, it's not going to be a picnic. There will be people who will oppose you. The enemy, the prince of this world will oppose you. But that brings us to the fourth reminder here in this short history of, of the church in Berea. Fourth, we are reminded that our God, the God we trust and serve, is still on His throne. Nothing, therefore, should deter us from serving our God. Nothing should deter us from becoming faithful to the Word of God. I wish I could tell you there's good news if you're faithful to the Word of God. I wish I could tell you that all the world outside will love you for it. But that won't happen. You will be persecuted. You will be rejected. But we must all remember that no matter how hard things get for our church because we are faithful to the gospel, we must remember that Christ Jesus still rules. He is still on His throne. And all that we are called to do is be faithful. 
Be faithful to what is before you. Yes, God will even arrange the persecutions of our most merciless and unyielding foes in order to do us good and to further our Savior's cause and to increase His kingdom. Yes, even the persecutions will be arranged by God. If people come up against this church, and, I'm, and I know your story, I know what you've been through recently, I know how, you, how you've been attacked and accused falsely. Well, let me just say this. Even that was arranged by God. For your good. Romans 8, 28 still holds, right? That's something that we can always run to and say, we may not understand why these things happen to our church. We've been many this year in higher up. We can tell you stories how we've been challenged this year. But I just keep gathering the church. I would tell the church, I would tell the church this, look, we're just trying to remain faithful to the gospel. One thing they cannot say is we have left the gospel. They cannot say that. We remain steadfast in preaching the gospel. And so I would always call the church, and I pray that you will, that, that is the same call I issue to you. In the midst of your, the attacks laid against you, I call you to vote in. Just vote in. You know, he, oh yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's a vote in. Tan -tan 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 in other words, let's just come united. Let's just come united together because we love the gospel. Let them deride us for what they do, what they do, for what we do. Let them attack us. But one thing we know, Christ Jesus still reigns. Amen. But notwithstanding the opposition, we cannot ignore the result of Paul's ministry. It says in verse 12, therefore many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. This means that in Berea, as in Thessalonica, and Philippi before that, a church was established that grew strong and eventually was able to send missionaries to other places. We already know that Luke stayed behind in Philippi. And here in Berea, we find Paul's company is reduced still further. Remember, they started out with four people. Silas and Timothy stayed on at Berea while Paul went alone to Athens. And we know the reason for this. The early church churches needed leaders to strengthen them. That is why Paul allowed his co-workers to stay on. But if you look at it from a point of view, it seems that what Paul was doing was dividing what was already a pitifully small force. Just four men set out to conquer Europe. Four men. We know that people had set out to overturn, that Paul had set to overturn Europe and the entire Roman world. And in order to do this, he formed a team comprising of just four workers, himself, Silas, Timothy, and Luke, who had joined them along the way. And what does Paul do? He leaves Luke in Philippi, Silas and Timothy in Berea, and then goes on by himself to Athens. Later, they will rejoin him, but after that, he will dispatch them again. Timothy back to Thessalonica and Silas somewhere else. We do not know where because the book of Acts does not tell us. So what we see here is a small, inadequate force setting out to fulfill a grand mission. And from a human point of view, anybody can see that they have bitten more than they can chew. Yet, because we have the privilege of hindsight, we know one thing. They accomplish the unimagined. As men and women everywhere, Jews and Greeks, young and old, slave and free, were led to the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, as it turns out, the entire Europe and Roman world was no match for this little band of men carrying a powerful message. He conquered Europe and the entire Roman world. If we desire to be used of God in nation building, let us be like the noble-minded Bereans 
time we hear God's word preached, let us receive the word, examine it carefully, and respond to it in faith and obedience. Glory to God for his wonderful saving gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for you have entrusted to us, your people, your most holy word, the gospel. Though we have come to salvation in Christ, we confess to you, dear God, that many times we have taken for granted your word, the scriptures. Many times we do not even open your word throughout the week and only open this when we come here on Sunday. We ask forgiveness for our failures, dear Lord. We ask forgiveness for our sins. But we, we pray, dear God, that you might help us to become like the wonderful Bereans. We thank you, God, that they, you have set this example in your word. So help us, Father. Help us to be a people, a noble-minded people who will receive, examine carefully, and respond in, in obedience every, every time we hear the word preached. We trust, Lord, that you will also help us not to focus our minds on the speaker, but on God alone, on Christ alone, who is our Savior and Shepherd. We thank you, God, for our time together. We do pray, Father, that you'll continue to bless the entire day, the week ahead. We pray, God, that your grace might abound so that we might continually glorify you and be a shining lights in this darkened world. We give you praise and thanks, dear Father, for our time together. And we give you all honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God. Praise the Lord. What a powerful reminder to us. And I pray that this is something that we will continue to imbibe not only when we gather together, but let the Word of God be our meditation every day. Let us meditate on the Word of God day and night. If there is one thing that I pray a lot of times in my own prayer time, it is this. Lord, I pray that your people might love your Word. And I pray, Lord, that they might not only love the Word, but obey the Word. Because when we love the Word and obey the Word, our lives will fall in line with the will of God. And when we are in the will of God, we find refuge in Him. Amen? Let's rise from our seats right now and let's close in prayer. And let me ask the worship team also to come as we prepare for the final song. Lord, we thank you and bless you for the wonderful reminder that we were given once again through Pastor Bob. We thank you, O oh God, that he reminded us that we need to love the Word. We need to love the Scriptures. And our prayer, Lord, is that truth that Pastor Baba shared to us might be quickened, Lord, in our hearts. If there are some of us, Lord, who have lost our affection and our appetite with God's Word, we pray, Lord, that you will birth in us once again a hunger and a thirst for the Word of God. And we pray, Lord, that as we meditate on God's Word, we might encounter you in a very special way. And that we might see you for who you are, Lord. A God of greatness, a God of power, a God of splendor. Our Savior, our Deliverer, our Redeemer, O oh God. May we see all of that and may that cause us to worship you in a far greater way. May that cause us to love you, Father, like we've never loved you before. 
May we serve you like we've never served you before. Birth in us, Lord, a passion and a fire that we might return back, Lord, to our first love. We pray, O oh God, that grace might be upon us, that Christ might be formed in us, and that Christ might be glorified through us. We thank you, Lord, for this morning. We pray for your blessing upon Pastor Bob Suki and our Higher Rock Christian Church. We pray, Father, that as they launch into a ministry that seeks to bless other churches and other people, you will bless their efforts. You will bless, Lord, their ministry. You provide all the resources that they need. And we trust, Lord, that we, together with them, in our own small way, will build this nation for your glory. We thank you also for the opportunity to worship you through our tithes, our grace gifts, and our offerings. Lord, use them for the glory of your holy name. And would you be so kind and gracious to bless us not for the sake of self, but for the sake of your name and the sake of your King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. This morning, let us affirm the things that we believe.